bit around context as well. The, re the regional district of Nanaimo has about 145,000 people in it right now. Primarily, the biggest portion of that population lives in the city of Nanaimo, of which we have we, we, we don't uh, we have nothing to do with as far as water goes. And then you have Parksville and you have Qualic and the Lanceville, and that takes up another, I'm going to say 25,000, something like that. <clears throat> so, really, what we're talking about here today, um, both in the drinking water watershed protection context and then uh, in the bigger picture around pricing, is for a much smaller population. But it's a rural population. And I think, Eric, you brought up some points around rural populations and how are we going to deal with, with that, you know, that group. And I think we have some, some maybe some uh, thoughts anyway around that for you. Okay. Oh, God. Can we move off of that? <laughs> Is there hey, a, I created that slide, not Blake, so. <laughs> Just, right. You got it. Thank you, Nick. All right. So, actually, the context, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run you through our drinking water watershed protection uh, function that we started. John mentioned it earlier this morning. And I'm going I'm to talk about that just briefly, just to give you some context and show you the drop down from that program into pricing. The basis for everything we're doing, I'm talking about today, is that right there population growth, continuous, non stop population growth. We're about 145. By 2036, we're going to be in the 230 range, something like that. What does that look like? Yeah, 230, something like that. We're going to have a lot of people, a lot of people using water. And if they continue to use water at the same rate they're using it today, we're in double trouble. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think we all know this. We're one of the heaviest water users in the world, on average. Um, oh, I just wanted to say, uh, Pam and I at home are just a little below Israel. I just uh, want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Smell good, all that stuff. Yeah, that 5,000 meter on the street. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> hook it up twice a year. <laughs> and here's just some of the numbers. We've all seen these numbers. Um, yeah, we use a lot of water. I don't think anything more has to be said about that. Okay, drinking water, watershed protection, or John referred to it as the action for water. That was the nomenclature, the, the naming we used for the program when we were out to the public just before the referendum back in 2008. And that helped us uh, give a written to the, to the public on what, what it is we were trying to achieve. It's a drinking water and watershed protection uh, function that is now in place and we tax for it. We get about half a million a year uh, to, to carry out the program. We have a coordinator, all those good things. But basically, the program was put in place because we needed a better understanding, a clearer, a clearer understanding of the science and the, and the wherewithal of our water, our, our water resources, our groundwater and surface water resources in the region to improve our land use decision making. That's kind of what this whole program is wrapped around. If we can't make good land use decisions, if we continue to make land use decisions that we've always made because we've always made them, that population curve I showed and that use curve will continue and we'll be, in, we'll be in serious trouble. So we've got to get a handle on that. We've got to understand what the interaction is between groundwater and surface water. What's happening with the surface water supplies as we see climate change happen and, and, and come on board. And what's going on with groundwater? We really don't have a good idea of what's going on with groundwater. So we're building our understanding of, of those water resources, developing that scientific groundwork we're going to work to reduce the vulnerable sources and, uh, and, and, the, and the impacts on ecosystems and, of course, increase our level of knowledge. So when we make those decisions, we're, they're good ones. A little note on the bottom that came up this morning. Understanding that the system um, puts a value on it. Right now, and I, I've always termed the water use in BC as the Wild West. There is no groundwater legislation. And use water as you will. It's cheaply priced. So therefore, no value. <clears throat> you bring the cost of it up, that brings a monetary value, which is OK. I mean, it does help us steer the troops a little bit. But it's very unfortunate that the only way we can apply the value to something that's important as water is by putting a dollar bill on it, which is sad, but there you go. OK, that myself. OK, 
and uh, on the on the drinking water watershed protection since over the last two years, it's been a slow start, but we have had some significant uh, progress underway. One of the things in the regional district, we have about 14 observation wells that the Ministry of Environment monitors and reports on. Not nearly enough. So we, we're going to up that by about another 10. That will give us good coverage in the region and better understanding of our groundwater resources. That's underway. We hope to be drilling this this year on the first days of that program. So that will bring us up to 24. Ministry of Environment, of course, is going to take on the data management and reporting. They'll continue to do that on their partnership. Um, the Team Water Squad, that was mentioned a little earlier. Um, that's our, our ed outreach, education outreach program. And the regional district started that back in 2005. And gradually over time, we've uh, brought in almost all of the municipalities into that program. So that uh, we administer that uh, it's a water conservation messaging program for the most part. It'll morph into watershed uh, uh, issues as well. But it allows us to provide a platform for a consistent message within the regional district in all the areas, the rural and the urban. So we're quite happy with that. We're partnering with the Ministry of Environment and Surface Water Quality Monitoring. They have a current program in place for a few of the rivers in the regional district. Uh, we've encouraged them to move forward on some of the smaller waterways and to give us a better picture of what's going on with the ecology within those rivers. And that starts this year with uh, French Creek being included in the, in the list, of their, in list of their rivers. And Eric, this is a good one, I think, and maybe goes right to the heart of what you're talking about. The WellSmart program, it's modeled after WellAware back east in Ontario and other places. But basically, it's a, it's a public program. We're going to be going out, uh, talking to people, giving seminars, um, uh, public, uh, public uh, meetings on how they can protect their water resource, wellhead protection, um, all, the, all the elements you want people to understand so that they're not, uh, number one, causing themselves issues, but number two, creating significant issues for the neighbors and for, for that broader groundwater constituency. We've just finished off um, some comprehensive comprehensive um, community consultation. Um, we did that over the last six months, uh, meeting with a number of groups, community groups, technical groups, to develop and focus our, uh, our agenda where we want to go. And um, so we can start budgeting uh, for that and, and focusing the program in a more serious manner. So that's, uh, that's almost halfway through. We've got work to do on that in the coming months. So that's, the, that's basically the drinking water uh, program, and watershed protection program, and what we're doing. What I want to do now is just a little bit of a, well, how do, what does that mean for pricing? Well, if we're talking about valuing, valuing water, and if we're talking about reducing the impact of withdrawals of, of water resources for human consumption and use, then really what we're talking about is water pricing as a subset of the drinking water program. And uh, so that we're putting it in, we're nesting it in, in, in that way. So a big part of this will be placing a value on the number so that we can get we can get the cooperation of the public. So that's the link to the drinking water watershed protection program. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our experience around pricing. Now before I get started, the incline block I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the idea of the incline block is not new to the regional district of Nanaimo. In fact, it's been around, it's been around all since we started metering in the late 80s. So all of our systems are metered and um, that's been in place. But it was uh, in seven different systems, it was seven different price schedules and approaches and parcel taxes and user fees and it was all over the map and totally unjustifiable. We needed to clean that all out and then start again with a new set, a consistent set of pricing based on what it actually cost us to deliver water to the customer. So that's what we did. And we did it for these people. Oh, forgot the arrow. Sorry, that's the arrow. So you just didn't get the whole thing I just talked about because I didn't show you the arrow. Not yet. Okay, so our customers. We've got little Mrs. Smith, she's the one on income assistance, and she hasn't got a lot of money, but she needs water. Talked about that. And then we've got Mr. and Mrs. Joe Average. They're not doing too bad. They've got good income, some kids at home, that sort of thing. And they're average users of water. They, they use, you know, rating around a meter, 1.3 meters a day in the summer, that sort of thing. And then we've got our water hogs. We'll just use, continue to use that naming. And um, yeah. And they all live on this use curve that we've got, that we see, and I'm pretty sure this use curve is not 
atypical, probably very similar in any community because we're all basically the same sort of creature. There's people that use a lot of resources. The mass amount of us use a nominal amount or, a, or an average amount, and then there's the, the uh, low, low users. So this, what this graph is, this is one of our systems, about 2,600 connections, and I just sorted them based on use. Right through. So that's, you can see, like the very, very high, we've got like four or five, right? But basically high use is in this range, typically expect 10% of the population. Similarly at the far end, 10, 10%, something like that. And then this is, this is the great unwash. This is, this is the group of most of the people that you're dealing with here. And they kind of drive what you're doing in pricing. Any idea what percentage of the total consumption would be in that last group? Percentage of the total consumption? Oh, mm. no, not off the top of my head. I did know that one time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I failed. Yeah, Tony totally wouldn't be as slick as you. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the basis. When we're looking at what we're going to do with pricing, this is the sort of thing you want to keep in mind. You want to be able to provide water to someone who can barely afford it. But have people that can really afford it and really use it, pay for it dearly. So here are some of the, some of the goals that we had. Um, okay, this is a Kirk's going to bring this up. But parcel we use parcel taxes and user rates. That's how we fund our water systems, right? You can you can change parcel tax to um, a fixed fee if you like. Call it whatever you like. It's a, it, everybody pays the same amount. And um, in, in the case I'm using, it's $260 a year. And then so that the, um, the operation, if you like, would be paid for 25% through the parcel tax and 75% through user fees. And the reason we did that, not 100% user fees, because of the volatility that you'd introduce if you went 100% user fees. So we, we said, okay, we're gonna use our, our parcel taxes to help um, a little bit with the operation. Primarily the parcel taxes are there for your capital expenditures, your debt, that sort of thing. And at least in the regional district of Nanaimo, that's how we get it. We want to maintain the incline block structure, provide incentives to reduce use. We want to introduce uh, much higher pricing for uh, higher users. Um, managed increases where necessary. All that means is we had to phase it in over a couple of years in a couple of our water systems just because of the cost increase. And the amount we wanted to get back, the amount of money we wanted to generate, actually um, was, uh, we're, we're shooting for 75% of the, of the cost of a meter, a cubic meter of water. So the, the, the remainder of parcel tax. For, that, for, uh, for us, um, that worked out to about 86 cents, if you really do the math there. Or, or uh, the amount we did actually collect at the time when we looked at rates was about 45%. So we had to bring it up. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Your, um, like your base rate or the parcel tax or whatever you want to call it, is that per property or per meter? Well, it's, it's per meter. Per meter. Yeah. Okay. And we're primarily residential, so property is a meter, is a property. So it's it's the same thing. So if you have more than one meter on a property, though, how would you do that? Ah, you would only be charged the one parcel tax. When you go out to talk to people about about um, your rate changes and whatnot, um, you have to remember a couple of things I learned the hard way. They don't like change, so that, that's a big one. I, I was looking at um, going to a couple of blocks instead of, we had five, and we wanted to do that, and uh, just about two, from the public perception, right? They, they don't like that blocky approach. People respond to fairness and clarity, absolutely. They know what you're trying to achieve, and and, and, and and you're actually trying to supply water and look after the system, they're on site. And people really do not care about the heavy water user. If, if you've got heavy water users in a room in a public meeting, they don't talk. They, they talk to you later. Because the people in the room have no sympathy for it. Generally is what I found. You won't find people arguing, well, you know, we really should give a break to those guys that are using a lot of water. <laughs> so it doesn't happen. <laughs> And then the other little thing is, um, and we, I think everybody in this room knows this, but I just wanted to bring it up again. You've got a consistent message 
but you've got some key players. You've got the politicians who have to support it, work with you on it. And they have to they have to get a feel for what that's going to mean to their, 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 their constituents, right? The people that they serve. So that's, that's important stuff. The customer wants to know, what's, what does this mean? Is it really going to hit me in the pocketbook? Are you being fair? What are other systems doing? Et cetera, et cetera. And then from the organizational leadership perspective, um, that's where really the rubber hits the road because you've got to um, answer absolutely every question from soup to nuts on that because you've got a financial commitment that's going to support that system for a very long time. You want to test it and make sure it's strong. So um, when we looked at our the existing, these are the existing rates as they stood back in 2005. And you can see there's a number of different systems here. And we've got, we've already got our incline block rate, but we've got minimum daily rates anywhere from 15 cents to almost a dollar. Um, you know, and as the blocks go up, there's, there's just, there's, they're all over the map. And they were totally insupportable for us because we had no, we had no reason for it. It's just because that's how it was. And we just kept building on top of that. And that's why we needed to strip this out and start again. So when we got to the new rate structure, that's kind of what it looks like right there. We haven't forgotten about our major constituents. They're the ones we want to protect at the, at, at the low end, and the ones we want to make sure support the overall system at the high end. So they're in there. And basically what we've done here is we've gone to six, six uh, incline blocks, if you like. And we talked about this before, Kurt, the two, three, five, six, whatever. It's kind of, it kind of doesn't matter in, in my book. It's more what is, what's good with the public. Because at the end of the day, you're still going to generate the revenue. So what is the, the public comfortable with? And the public was very uncomfortable with being right next to a higher rate and all of a sudden tripping into that higher rate and their costs go like this. They wanted to be able to see their costs go up gradually. So that's what we tried to achieve with that. And we worked with a lot of community representatives on this and, and, and they were happy with that. And they were very happy with the high rate at the end. Everybody wanted to make sure Mrs. Smith was looked after at the moment. Yes, John? Mike, just uh, maybe when you're talking about this, when we were talking at the break, you might want to clarify that payment is per incremental yeah. volume of consumption. They yeah. They don't go to that rate for their full, right, full consumption. And what John was talking about there? If, if you're... Um, if you, you're up into here, you're, you know, in the summer you're using a lot of water, 1.4 to 2.1 cubic meters. Your bill isn't based on just that. Your bill is based on so much for this piece, so much for that piece, so much for this piece, and so much for that piece. So you're, it's going, it's, it's adding up in blocks. We don't just apply that one big price to this one block. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Now the, the impact or the change on the rates then from old, what, what I've done here is I've just said, okay, look, if, if we have a low, medium, and high user, and I'll define those by, in the winter, 0.25, and the, for the low user, 0.5 and 1, for the medium and high, and so on for the summer. Mm -hmm. The old user rates, not the parcel tax, user rates would gen generate this amount of money, and the new rates ended up generating that amount of money. Okay, so you see that's 6, 13, and 14 percent. Parcel tax stays the same, that's just parcel tax, and yeah, up it goes. That that's works that's per annum, those, those, those rates? That's, yeah, I tried to put together a, an annual, that, that's an annual cost for water. Yeah, yes, sir. Mike, can you explain what you do with a, like a condo in Nanaimo? We have one water meter for 120 bucks. Where would that fit in? Yeah, it, what, what we do, we don't have commercial rates, we just have the same rates for everybody. So in that case, what we would do is take the number of units and divide that into the meter amount and then calculate the bill. Okay, so the, 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 because it's one meter, the building itself would not necessarily pay the high volume rate. No, you don't, it, that's right. We take it. We take it into account that you've got a whole bunch of units. Get an average and charge it accordingly. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, the, the interesting thing about this, and it's counterintuitive, is that it works out to about a dollar a cubic meter on the user rates. But because everybody's paying the same tax rate, parcel tax rate, the actual cost per cubic meter is higher for the low user than it is for the higher user. Okay, if you just work out the numbers. I mean, they're paying less than the whole user. But if you actually work out the numbers, it's higher. Because they're, everybody's stuck with that same parcel tax rate. I don't really want to use this next slide, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> this is probably the classic never used in a meeting slide. But what it is, it, it shows the um, water production for a water system we have. And every year, right? Every, every one of those, don't, don't try and figure this out. It's, every one of these lines is a different year. But what I wanted to illustrate is that since we put in the, the, the rate change, we've never seen the consumption or production of water go above that dashed black line. This is the cleanest one I could find. Uh, we've got seven systems and then honestly, they're all over the map. But this was, you know, kind of an interesting one. This is all by itself and it's kind of an illustrative, I think it actually illustrates that we, we saw a difference. If we take all seven water systems and throw them in a, you know, into, into a table like this, this is what we're, we're seeing. Well, I guess what I'm trying to illustrate with this slide is that I'm not even, I'm not totally sure that the rates have created, you know, a, a really good reduction in use. I don't think use has gone up. Um, this, this line, if we look back to 2001, would say that it's in a steady decline. Uh, that's fine, but if you take the last five years and throw a line on it, it's a different story, it's actually going up. There's not enough data here to tell us the story because it, this is all weather dependent, right? You get a hot summer, up it goes. Cool summer, down it goes. And in a small data set like that, you have no idea what's going on. So, yes? Well, did you do any before and after random comparisons of some of the larger water users and see if the um, paint by volume had impacted their use? Well, again, um, yeah, we did. I, I'm not sure. Actually, what we did in the Team Water Smart side was we went into communities, we did some social marketing stuff, went into communities and focused on them, face to face contact. Did a lot of that, and in those areas, we saw up to a nine percent reduction. We were gone the next year. We weren't back. We went back up again. So, uh, yeah, it's early days for us. I'm not sure if we're going to see the impact or not. I would like to think we. Are. Yes. I know this where I am. When the first one on meters, people conserved water, but then when they started to realize, well, this is really costing me as much as I thought, the consumption went back up again. So now this year we need to have. Yeah, right. That just, I've seen that, you know, how the consumption goes back up again because they think, oh, it's, it's right. costing me that much. Uh, that, you know, I think in the price setting, and I don't know if we talked about this yet, but I think one of the problems that could happen is you, you price higher, people use less, your revenue drops, oops, put the price up. Mm -hmm. You start doing a seesaw thing with your rates, at least that's the fear. We have that fear a lot. We talked about that when I worked with uh, Aquavic on helping with these rates and setting the elasticity, right? and what that could mean to your revenue stream. And as an operator manager, it's a very un, um, unsettling feeling that you may be doing the right thing in one area only to really cause problems in another. That didn't actually happen. As far as I can tell, we didn't see huge changes because of the change in pricing. So, so far so good. Let me just, can I just make a point based on that? I think what's critical there is the fact that you did that that's why I think you're not seeing the penalty. Like the problem, you anticipated, so you thought, talked about these magic words like elasticity, and you did some of that analysis. That helps you find how you're gonna achieve your ultimate goal, as opposed to, which some places do, is just change the price and see what happens. And that's when you start getting into that seesaw business. Yeah, and, and one other point that I think goes to what we were talking about earlier is you got help. Right. You know, Aquavec does that kind of modeling, and so the assumptions about elasticity are built into the modeling that we do. So if you don't know, get some help from someone who yeah. does, and they'll build it into the production. Yeah, and Vernon Rogers and JP, I'm a little bit of a plug, yeah. um, and JP Jolly from Aquavec are excellent in helping you out with this sort of thing. They, uh, they know small systems, you know, and they're very good. In the end, actually, uh, we had the model built, and we did all kinds of scenarios. 
Uh, we just kind of did our own thing in the end outside of JP's model. But we couldn't have done or understood what we were doing without all that previous work in. Okay, just a couple more slides. Um, so we, we achieved a few things. We did do that 75-25 split, and it, it's still there to this day. So we'll continue with that. We'll, we'll look at what, what is the actual cost for water, and we'll, we'll look at that number and make sure that still makes sense. Uh, we we in, uh, modified that incline block, and we did it with the support of the community, which was really good. Um, having Mrs. Smith at that far end and the 27 cents a day uh, daily charge is good for Mrs. Smith, but it's also good for that, that middle ground, that group of people in the middle ground who may want to reduce. It gives them a place to go. Give them somewhere to go. If they want to reduce use and reduce their costs, they can do it. So if you can set that up, that's good. And the rest of it, uh, yeah, higher price for higher users. Actually, I did try, and I got a real bounce back, so I got to think about this, but I did actually talk about that last block, it was 315 or whatever it was, that last block. Introduced some discussions in the RDN about doubling that. Maybe on a seasonal, we're not sure. Um, but politically, that one just went flat. So I got to go back and think about that, think about how you handle that. And, um, but the seasonal approach, I like that a lot. I think that makes sense. And I really liked your idea about taking sprinkling regulations just out of the picture. Deal with it in your pricing. That's a gutsy move, I don't know. It might be worth trying. So we, we got some things done and we can pat ourselves on the back. We think we're doing okay there, but there's, we're still not sure we're reducing consumption over the long term. Um, we don't think it'll produce those price bumps, that seesaw action, but who knows. Um, and jury's out on price points. Uh, we think it's okay, but uh, I think it's probably something you should review every few years and make sure you're on top of it. Go back and test your old assumptions and, and, and run through it again. So, but uh, at least in our case, we've got the structure there. So that, that's good. So I don't think I have anything else to say.